Greetings. This is John Savers on World War II. My name is John Savers. I'm your host. And today we will commence with a look at this most important subject. Now I know some of you will say, most important? 60 years ago, 70 years ago, who cares? It's ancient history. Well, I might take that point of view myself, uh, except uh, it continues to be uh, a factor in the media and in print uh, of uh, the novels and, uh, and so forth, the book uh, group um, as opposed to the journalist group. And uh, so I, I think it, um, as long as it lives there, it may as well uh, have a, um, uh, a place at this station. When on September 1st, 1939, war erupts on the Polish frontier, an earth-shaking revelation will astonish the world public. And what is it? It is the revelation of a form of military genius that completely transforms the strategy and tactics of the past. One might have thought that nothing predisposed him to such a discovery. For suddenly there surges forth a man who will completely transform the military problem across the world and this man is Hitler and he transformed them he reached this result with a confidence in himself it was absolutely astounding there are five million soldiers officially enemies who can fall upon him at any time to risk an adventure in Norway to prevent the English from taking him by the north is extraordinarily risky. He's not yet ready for it. He has no ships. The German fleet is not even one-third the size of the English fleet. He doesn't have enough troops to go up there. He would have to divert troops from elsewhere. He would have to divert aviation. And it is possible, even probable, that at the moment when he would risk all up at the tip of Europe, below the North Pole, it is just at this moment that the English and the French would exploit the situation by pouncing on him via the Maginot Line and perhaps even via Belgium. Well, to count on his generals to launch such a dangerous adventure, it would have been hopeless naivete on his part. The heads of the German army, the old heads of the German army, from the beginning have been against him. They were already against him at the moment when he reoccupied the Rhineland. Already at that time, they had cried out in terror. They had done everything so that Hitler would not even engage in the Austrian operation as they would later oppose the war against France. All these old and bemetalled generals of the Third Reich were absolutely opposed, 
Oppose. Not just oppose, but certain that Hitler would lose. This is what is stupefying. It can be seen how the military, in fact, never changes. They had been beaten in 1918, so by rights they should be beaten again in 1940. But everything had changed. A new strategy had been invented, transforming completely the contours of the problem. But they had not understood the problem. They had not understood the new strategy. And they were still mentally thinking of the France of Foch, which they thought would annihilate them in just a few weeks. So Hitler knew that he had there not just opponents, but opponents who would do everything to sabotage him. He reached a point with the head of German troops in the West, General von Brauchitz, had come to enjoin him at the General Staff Headquarters in November to not take on France. Hitler had to finally show him the door. This was an important incident because behind him there were Alder and also Beck, who were the most important military chiefs of that time. There was only one man who understood, who understood his plans, and that was von Manstein. And von Manstein, Beck had chased him away from the Western Front. He had sent him into exile to Dresden to take a peacetime type command, hundreds of kilometers from the border. So not only could Hitler not count on any support whatsoever in the preparation of such a risky operation, but he knew that these people automatically would be against it. It is for this reason that he seizes the initiative and that he alone will take into his hands this project, this plan, and this decision. And here, everything that I will tell you, I will not tell you based on notes which one can read on all the literature of the Second World War, but based on the things that Hitler himself told me in confidence. This Norwegian affair, I know it from his own mouth. He himself explained to me, phase by phase, what happened. Starting with how he chose a leader for this operation, which had to be doable by February 20th, 1940. Hitler will call into his office at the Reich Chancellery a general whom he does not even know personally and who is called General von Falkenhorst. This general had been, in 1919, one of the heroes of the volunteers' campaign in Finland fighting the Bolsheviks. So he knew very well the Nordic countries. Hitler, without even demanding the advice of the general staff, without even informing von Brauchitz, calls him in and explains to him his plan, saying, there you have it. We are under the threat of an English attack into Norway, Sweden, and Finland. We risk being completely turned by the north, and so we must be ready to mount an operation that will protect us. And for three hours, he lets von Falkenhorst explain to him his campaigns in Finland, 
And he explains to von Falkenhorst how he conceives the campaign. He begins to realize the value of the man. This is also a constant with Hitler. He wanted to really get to know the man. He gives him a good sniffing over, observes all his intimate reactions. And it is only when he is sure of his man that he decides, and then he can calmly give him carte blanche. Well, that is what happened with von Falkenhorst. After three hours of conversation, he tells him, well, listen, this operation, it has to be imagined in your head, and it is you that I appoint to make it all work. The general, rather stupefied, says to him, but I've never been in Norway. For me, it's a completely new problem. <laughs> the coasts of Norway, they are not Finland with its forests and hundreds of kilometers to cross. There are considerable technical problems here. Would you permit me for a couple of hours to think about it? And it's Hitler himself who told me what happened next. He had him leave to get a bite in town. And on the way to get a bite, what did he do? He went into a bookstore and bought the Baedeker guidebook for tourists. It was with the Baedeker guidebook that one of the riskiest military operations in history was conceived. A guidebook in English, by the way. And it was there, while eating a small snack, that Falkenhorst studied the coasts of Norway, saw where the ports were located, and what could be the possibilities of debarkation. And at five o'clock, he meets up with Hitler again. I am your man. I shall act. And during a few weeks, Falkenhorst will prepare silently, in an absolute silence, his plan. The only role which von Brauchitz, Alder, and Beck will have is to obey an order from Hitler that demands that they place at his disposition five divisions of infantry. That's their whole role. And von Brauchitz, when he sees von Falkenhorst again, starts in to tell him off, saying, I know that you are thinking a madman's idea. But I must obey because five divisions are being ordered from me, which I must divert from the Western sector. I don't even want to know what is going to be done with my soldiers. This does not stop Falkenhorst from slaving away for two more weeks. And already on the 18th of March, he can say to Hitler, I am ready. When Hitler sees that finally he has found his man to command the operation, what does he do? He will personally see each of the sector chiefs who will be participating. And he organizes in his own office a meeting where all those will appear that Falkenhorst has chosen as future chiefs of each point of the debarkation. In fact, not the division chiefs, not the regimental chiefs, but instead the lowly battalion chiefs, all those who at a modest level will be intervening. 
Et cette réunion se tient le 1er avril. This meeting takes place encore, on the 1st of April. J'en ai connu la description. Here again, I know the description from Hitler himself. Imaginez ces jeunes garçons. You can imagine these young boys who have themselves never seen Hitler, who were simple lieutenants, at the most captains, called into the chancellery, and finding themselves in Hitler's huge office, with Hitler receiving them like young comrades. On the wall, there is an immense map of the coast of Norway, about seven meters in height. Hitler takes one by one all these boys and he leads them each in turn to this enormous map. He says to them, you, it's here that you will disembark and this is what you will do. Each one of these young officers receives from Hitler himself the, the precise explanation of his mission. But there you will say, but how could he know the mission of each one with such precision? Well, that is one more of the very astonishing things about the case of Adolf Hitler. It was his absolutely prodigious memory, surpassing all the norms. Hitler, that is the man who knows the power of each artillery piece, who knows the possibilities of each armored group, and can explain exactly to each one of his men what he exactly must do, what difficulties he will encounter, how they can manage them and win. And for each of these boys, it is an unheard of spectacle. The man who at this moment is the most powerful in Europe and perhaps in the world, who studies each map, who treats every one of them like a true comrade, and even with the simplicity that is disarming, he set up an immense buffet. He is facing the map against the wall and he leads himself these boys. He has them take a sandwich. He has them drink a glass of fruit juice. All this happens in an atmosphere of camaraderie. These young officers had no idea of before. There never was an old general who had his young collaborators eat a sandwich while he personally explained to him his role. So here you have an invasion troop which morally has been lifted to the maximum of its human possibilities. All these boys have esprit de corps. They had been together with Hitler. They would spend eight hours there. The session starts at 11 in the morning and runs through 7 o'clock at night. And everyone eats as much as he wants to gather his forces for the mission. Everyone participates in the general briefing, and each one gets his individual briefing. So now, there is a small army for debarkation. Small, but already morally invincible. And they have to be morally invincible. Because what Hitler has just proposed, no one else would have dared to propose. That's how risky it is. It is one of the riskiest acts which Hitler has ever undertaken. By the way, Hitler is fundamentally a gambler. He plays head or tails. This is a man who each time has gambled everything to win. And here he risks everything. Because he senses the danger. This is another detail about Hitler. How his nose can smell out the dangers. He can smell them. He knows them well. It's not necessary to explain things to him. He knows that the danger exists. And by the way, the true urgency will be revealed when in the middle of the Norwegian campaign, an English unit is seized with its general staff papers.
He recovered the complete plans for the English debarkation. When the Germans have already embarked, it has been two days that the English have already been at sea. Hitler not only smelled it, but he smelled it at the right time. Because the others have already been en route for 48 hours. The Germans set out on the 2nd of April for the landings of the 8th of April. And why? Why a week in advance? Because Hitler wanting at any price to hide his game will go to such a point of imprudence that he lets his debarkation votes depart one by one. He does not send off a fleet as do the others. The others, the English for example, as in the Dardanelles campaign in Turkey in 1915, send a fleet with all their men on it. Well, Hitler lets his boat leave one by one. Lone ships like Corsairs. And it will be so well hidden that no one will fear a major operation. For six days, the boats will depart, one after the other, discreetly along the coasts. Each boat all alone. No one could fear that there was much danger from one single boat. Those who are traveling the farthest depart the first. All these departures are marvelously staggered out. And between the 2nd and the 8th of April, we see all these debarkation teams which have gone up one after the other and which are by the 8th, each facing its objective. Nothing, absolutely nothing has been discovered. So there only remains for Hitler to unleash like a tornado at the last second those who will maneuver en masse, on land. Because just as in the Polish campaign, with those several thousands of tank men, several tens of thousands of tank men who did the essential part of the operation. The boys in these boats are no more than several tens of thousands in total. So these five divisions attack by parachute or arrive from the large ships. The few big warships which Hitler has are at risk from the English on the high seas up until the last minute. But they must arrive as soon as possible in Copenhagen, throughout Denmark, and in Oslo, Norway. In one morning, Denmark is submerged. The Danes hadn't anticipated anything. Basically, they did not understand anything. In a few hours, they are entirely swallowed up by one German division. This was a reduced division out of the five divisions in total. There were those divisions for Norway. Those for Norway, in the night, rushed off their several big ships. One of them was, by the way, sunk in the Bay of Oslo. But that very morning, they are in Oslo. So it is at that moment that all along the coast, these groups of young Germans, led by intrepid officers, and who were at the peak of their potential and their enthusiasm, launch themselves onto the beaches. All these are taken almost without combat. And the English, who were already at sea, learn stupefied that the country is already following into the hands of the Germans. The most dangerous part of the operation has in any case been done. The Germans are no longer at sea with the British fleet behind them. They were on the high seas. They have now left it behind. They are on the shoreline. So the English, yes, they will debark, but it's already too late. They will debark at Trondheim. They will debark at several neighboring ports. And a little bit later, they will debark up at Narvik. However, the Germans will already be solidly entrenched. But with Hitler's usual methods, that is to say, immediately with masses of both aviation and tanks, 
That seems impossible here. They were not able to bring armored divisions up there. Plus, the routes are too difficult for tanks. And additionally, it would have taken up too much space on the boats. But the aviation and the parachutists arrived by air just in time. Nobody saw them arrive either. And that is what will crush on the ground the English who have debarked. They will resist for a dozen days, but they will be surrounded, taken prisoner, or thrown back into the sea. They will be neutralized. General Dietl will stand up to them. One half, it was the ground soldiers, and the other half were sailors from the ships that arrived. Well, Dietl forms these soldiers and sailors into a single unit, which has against it allied forces four times, five times larger. Hitler has, by the way, so well calculated his strike that he fixed the date at April 8th. Because that's the day when the Aurora Borealis goes away. Thus an absolutely thrown together unit. These folks will dig in at Norway. They will dig in behind Norway. They will dig in at the Norwegian-Swedish border. But no one will succeed in wearing them down. It is aviation can descend without worry en masse back south and toward the Western Front. And that the grand campaign against Holland Belgium and France will commence the 10th of May, 1940. Out of time again, uh, this is John Sabers on World War II.